right. Hello. Um, so it's eight o'clock here and we'll get started. Um, welcome to Ocular Pathology Rounds with Coplow. Uh, today we'll have some presentations by me, Megan, uh, Leandro, and Gillian. And without further ado, let's get started. I said, there we go. All right, so the first case. Go, um, uh, oh, bigger screen, yeah, yes. Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, so the first case is Lena. Uh, Lena is a approximately six-year-old spay female domestic long-haired cat. Um, long story short, she had a shallow anterior chamber. Um, on fundic exam, she had uh, morning glory retinal detachments. Um, and they couldn't see the optic nerve head. Um, so she had some some visual issues. <laughs> um, and there was also some subretinal echogenic debris. Um, I think I'm going to go straight to the gross and the histo, and then I'll share some additional features of the history uh, after that. Um, uh, so here's the uh, gross photo. Um, we have the cornea up top, uh, as usual. Um, and the anterior chamber is fairly quiet. There's maybe a little bit of keratitis. Most of what's going on is in the posterior segment. Um, so we have some retinal attachment here. This is the retina all attached. And then um, very interestingly, we have an extremely thickened uh, central choroid here. It's sort of tan, um, looks pretty solid. Uh, and there's kind of also this sort of uh, multifocal speckled appearance to the choroid um, adjacent to the area of overt thickening. Um, so that's our gross. Let's go to histo. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the subgross. Make that happen. There we go. All right, so here's the subgross. Again, the anterior part of the eye is pretty quiet and everything that's interesting is shaking in the back. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have the optic nerve right here. It's a little, there's a little bit of handling artifact to it, but uh, trust me, that's the optic nerve. And then we have that really, really um, significant choroidal thickening. And, uh, sorry? It's going to focus a little bit. Oh, okay. I can focus a little bit more, maybe. Yeah, it's probably not going to be. <laughs> it's uh, as good as it might get, maybe. Um, so, uh central choroidal thickening, and then also we have uh, extension into the central retina. Um, go like this, and then it'll be more focused too. Uh, wait, and there we go, as far back as we can go. Yeah. So here again is that look, we've rotated uh, 90 degrees to the right, um, or clockwise, I should say. <laughs> um, we have uh, this thickened choroid. This is where the optic nerve is. Again, a little bit of handling artifact, but you can see that that inflammation extends into the optic nerve. It's very hypercellular. Um, and the same thing, inflammation extending into the central retina. And let me prove to you that it is inflammation. Going in closer. Um, we've got a uh, mixed cellular population. There's lots of neutrophils, lots of lymphocytes and plasma cells, and there's a good number of histiocytes as well. Here's a macrophage right there. Um, so there's mixed inflammation in this choroid, really significant. And let me back out so I'm not going to make everybody sick. There are some pretty uh, large areas of necrosis as well. You can add, ah, there we go. You can see these kind of coalescing areas where we have sort of a posse cellular look. Um, and there's eosinophilic and uh, karyoretic necrotic debris replacing this tissue. Um, so a really severe inflammatory choroiditis that's extending into the optic nerve and the retina. Um, now, I'm just going to skip straight to our histochemical stains because I think it's easier to see what we need to see on them. Um, we did both, or we have both a PAS for fungus and a GMS in this case to compare, which is kind of fun. Um, so I'm going to start with the PAS for fungus, and we're going to go right to where this handy circle is. <laughs> but we don't really need the circle as it turns out. So this is right at the optic nerve head, sort of in the midst of this inflammation. The camera may disprove of the green, but we'll see what we can do. Leave a little bit of black. There we go, though. We can see it pretty well what we've got here. Uh, I have a whisper to go higher. 
So um, you can start to see these bright magenta um, spots here. And they're kind of all over the place. There's a large number of them. Here's a good field right here. Get as focused as we can. Um, you can see that these guys have um, a bit of a nucleus um, and they have a bit of a wall. They're really small, maybe about three micrometers diameter, um, sort of oval shaped organisms. They tend to be both uh, extracellular and interhistocytic. Um, and they're showing up with the PAS for fungus as well as. Find areas that are convincing, as well as on the GMS. So you can see these really crisply outlined walls of these guys on uh, the GMS. Um, so there's large numbers of these small yeast organisms. Um, and the interesting bit of history in this case is that uh, this cat tested positive on serology for toxoplasma and then negative for a, a wide variety of other organisms that are common causes of feline uveitis, including histoplasma which is weird um, because this uh, case is extremely morphologically consistent <laughs> with histoplasmosis. Um, so let's transfer to back to our PowerPoints. Here's our diagnoses. Um, so it's weird, especially since this case is a pretty organism rich infection. Um, there's lots of those little yeasts around. Um, but uh, negative on um, serology for histoplasmosis. Um, the toxoplasma uh, positivity, um, it's possible that uh, this cat does have toxoplasma as well. Um, they will often test positive on serology for toxoplasma as well, cats. Um, so it may have basically just been an incidental thing. Um, so, but uh, the organisms that we were looking at were histoplasma and not toxoplasma. Toxoplasma shouldn't be positive on the GMS at least. So um, kind of an interesting case in terms of sort of a disconnect between the, the clinical findings and the histo findings. Also, um, geographic location of the patient. Where yes, the cat from. that's a good thing to point out because the cat is from Florida um, and then also had previous residence in Indiana. Basically, this, this cat belonged to someone who lived in Indiana for several years and then moved to Florida. So um, uh, Indiana is especially kind of a, a hotbed for um, uh, histoplasma. Uh, so, um, yeah, kind of an interesting case like that. Uh, and also a really good example of uh, histoplasma, uh, despite the clinical serology results. Um, all right. What kind of serology is the histoplasma? Now, that is a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. It's not surprising. The... Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to be able to get my status. Um, I believe negative, although uh, I'm not sure if I have it written down here either. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's another good point thing to point out. Good point. Long-term steroid therapy. therapy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, one of the things that we looked into when I did a survey of our uh, cat is the plasmosis was uh, co-infection and didn't, well, it didn't pan out. There were there were no obvious um, associations with FIV uh, positivity or not, and also the tests um, sensitivity and sensitivity were all over the place too. So um, a lot of um, yeah, a lot of of the urine antigen, a lot of the antibodies. Uh, PCR was the one that seems to be more. Um, uh, more adequate for diagnosis and um, uh, tracheobronchial lavage, all the ones that did that turn out to recover positive organisms. Yeah, it does make a, a lot of sense that basically if this cat is uh, immunosuppressed and we're checking by serology for an immune response to the organism to define its presence, you know, it makes sense that we would have issues mm -hmm. with that in an immunosuppressed animal. I think these are all good points. Um, all right, if nothing else, we'll go to the next case. What's the distribution you'd expect to see with histoplasma, like a posterior statement like that? 
Yeah. More or less, yeah. I mean, it can it can be more extensive, um, but yeah, especially in the the uvia of cats, okay. Okay. and especially for interior or something you know, like that. No, classically okay. presents as a pararetina is. Yeah. So back of the eye, choroid retina, but we've seen anything from like a panophthalmitis mm -hmm. to, you know, just a very small, tiny areas of inflammation on the chronic cases with our organisms. Okay. Yeah, so it's not always it's not always that solid sort of mass effect, right? Yeah. It's uh, sometimes it can be scattered mm -hmm. okay. cells like in the subretinal space or vitreous and yeah. a little messier. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, uh, the next case is Nightshade, another kitty. Nightshade is a 13-year-old spayed female domestic short-haired cat. Um, they describe um, tapetal scars in both eyes, very interesting, consistent with taurine deficiency. Um, so they were located in dorsolateral or dorsotemporal tapetum, which is kind of the classic location um, for taurine deficiency-induced retinopathy. Um, typically, that's in the area centralis, so sort of a little bit dorsal and mostly temporal to the optic nerve um, and kind of in the central retina. Um, so they were wondering about uh, taurine deficiency-induced retinopathy. Um, but also, this cat had a history of chronic glaucoma of unknown cause. Uh, so the globe is enlarged, there's an exposure of keratitis and a subluxated lens. Um, so kind of two problems, uh, retinopathy, and then mainly this globe had developed glaucoma, and they didn't know what it caused. So um, we have this globe here. And uh, I'll point out the anterior uvea here. Um, basically, it, it doesn't look all that thickened, but maybe a little bit distorted and kind of um, like soft looking, a little sort of tattered um, as the blade passed through it. Um, but like very, you know, not very thickened, very sort of low profile, but I'll point it out all the same for what we found later. Um, we do have kind of um, not much else to point out, I guess I would say. The lens was subluxated, probably a little bit of cataractus here, a little cloudy. You can see the cloudy cornea as well um, due to a bit of corneal disease in this case. Um, and yeah, without further ado, let's go to the histo. Uh, and I'm not clicking the right thing. There we go. I'm going to show you this one first. The subgross is not focused. Yeah, it's fair. I'll skip the subgross. All right. Um, so here is the front of the eye. Um, so we've rotated 90 degrees clockwise again with the cornea on our right. And the section isn't great uh, right here, but um, you can see that there's the iris on this side that is extremely hypercellular, way too purple, um, but actually not overtly thickened or distorted. Um, we'll go to the other side as well, and you can see something similar here. Very little thickening. <laughs> and here. Um, here, maybe a little bit more distortion of the tissue, but again, it's not a very thick iris. And then what I'll do is come in closer and show you what is causing that. Look at that. Um, so these are neoplastic cells that are invading the iris stroma. They extend a little bit into the ciliary body. Um, and these guys are showing off the classic appearance of feline diffuse iris melanoma. Um, so this neoplasm can be quite pleomorphic in terms of the cellular features. Um, we've got this one with three nuclei here. We've got varying degrees of pigmentation. This one with two nuclei has a good number, good amount of pigment. This one has a good amount of pigment. A lot of them don't have a lot of pigment to them. Um, there's a lot of variability in nuclear size and shape. And actually right on the edge of this field here, we have um, a nuclear pseudo-inclusion. Um, this is also fairly common in phytums. Um, Basically, the cells can get so big that the cytoplasm will sort of bulge into the nucleus and create um, what looks like an intranuclear inclusion, but it's just like an invagination of cytoplasm, um, part of how like big and floppy these cells get, basically. Um, but the interesting thing about this one is, despite the fact that it's a full-blown phytum, um, it's uh, feeling diffuse iris melanoma, I'll say it uh, again in full. Um, it hadn't caused uh, too much overt thickening of the iris. So you can imagine like looking into this globe from the front, um, they may not have seen this as a mass clinically, right? Because the, the iris itself isn't terribly thickened. Um, so uh, basically the cause of glaucoma in this case uh, turned out to be distortion of aqueous outflow pathways by neoplasia. Um, 
So uh, that was sort of one answer for us. Um, and then we'll head on to the back of the globe. Now this section doesn't capture the optic nerve. You can see we're right at the edge of the optic nerve here. Um, this is sort of where all those blood vessels are right next to the optic nerve meninges. But I picked this section because it shows off some more of what's going on in the retina. Um, this was a horizontal cut um, to attempt to capture that uh, temporal area of the retina that we'd be interested in with taurine deficiency. Um, and the trouble in this case is that we do have some significant glaucoma induced retinal lesions as well. You can see that basically in this entire retina, there are very few ganglion cells. Here's one. Um, but particularly for a horizontal cut, there's not a lot there. The internuclear layer is often a little bit measly and, and weak as well. So there's some inner atrophy from the glaucoma, um, which makes it tough. But uh, multifocally, kind of in a central retina, we have these areas where there's significant thinning of the outer segment as well and sort of which, loss of those. Which should not happen in cats with glaucoma. Which should not happen in cats without glaucoma. That's a very important point to make. Oftentimes in canine glaucomas in the central retina, they'll lose structure to the retina almost. They'll get a full thickness atrophy. Um, and part of that is uh, thought to be ischemia in the central retina due to the severe distortion of optic nerve cupping, kind of uh, messing with the vascular supply of the central retina. Um, cats usually maintain the structure of their retina and just sort of lose the ganglion cells in glaucoma. Um, so the fact that this uh, retina is this badly affected does suggest to us that there's something else going on that's affecting the outer segment. Um, particularly here, we have like a reasonably uh, normal <laughs> of the inner nuclear layer, even though we've lost the ganglion cells due to glaucoma. Um, we have no photoreceptor segments here and the nuclear outer nuclear layer is looking extremely sparse. So um, we basically had a multifocal um, outer retinal atrophy. Um, in some areas, um, kind of where we would expect for taurine, um, although it's not specific for taurine. So you could see a similar sort of multifocal outer atrophy with just ischemic injury to the retina in general. Um, for a, one of the primary photoreceptor conditions, I guess in, in some cats, I think uh, it's Persian cats maybe, sometimes we'll get a primary photoreceptor generation. That would be more of like a diffuse change, um, not multifocal like this. Um, but it's an outer atrophy, um, and given the history, it potentially consistent with taurine, but not specific for. Um, so kind of two cool things to see in this globe. And also, if you go back to the interior segment, you could actually see that on a gross image, but there's a, a very significant angle recession in those yes, sides. Yes, that's a good point. And that happens with tumors and uh, in, in, in cats, particularly, you know, feline diffusarius melanomas, and even with inflammatory processes, where you go back there, you can see the distance between the endothelial membrane and the base of the iris is enormous, and that can also be one of the causes for the obstruction of the angle. Clinically, it will look like this very deep anterior chamber. I think this slide shows it off pretty well, in particular. So I'll um, I pulled this one. You can see uh, that decimase membrane ends kind of like round about here, and then the iris base is like way back here. So that's the angle recession is, that we're talking about. Is that also a break in decimase right there? I believe it is. Hmm. Yeah. So there's a little piece of decimase here, and then a break, and then more decimase here. This was a pretty bouthalmic globe, um, so potentially Hobbstria with oh. breaks in decimase, or especially peripherally in decimase membrane, it could be trauma-induced. Um, blunt ocular trauma uh, to the globe kind of tends to, the force of that tends to distribute out towards the periphery of decimase, and you'll get these peripheral breaks. Yeah, this is great. Look at that. Um, so yeah, the, the limbus is kind of like way up here, and decimase is like way back here ending, and then the iris is way back here. So that's, an, again, an example of that, that angle recession. And blunt trauma could also explain outer retinal atrophy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's true, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so. This cat could have experienced <laughs> some degree of blunt trauma. Although they, they say that... Um, the, the clinicians said that they thought it was taurine and he's based on the other eye as well. So right. yeah, they did. Maybe they know dietary history that we don't exactly. know as well. Yeah, tapetal scars in both eyes, they say consistent with taurine yeah, because of a class. Why I think we would suggest taurine deficiency is because of the history and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, assuming they know more than we do because otherwise it's kind of a rare thing nowadays with, you know, contemporary feline diets, let's put it that way. Like, well, that's the cat is on the home very strictly vegan diet. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. A vegan diet and an obligate carnivore sounds right. like a good idea. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, 
that's all I have to show you on this case. Here are, here are the diagnoses. Um, and we'll do the next case and I'll switch out. Um, all right. Leandro here, I apologize for my voice. A little bit under the weather. Um, my first case is uh, Precious, a one year, four month old female spade cat. Uh, no breed, doesn't matter to be honest. Uh, so they described Iris to corneal uh, noted at adoption um, and present back in uh let's see november so the yeah adopted the cat the cat already had those lesions that were seen and then later on they describe what looked like clinically as a scleral slash corneal mass so they were both suspecting of a syndicated cornea and a corneal slash limbo mass so they've enucleated it and this is what we got so here you can see the limbus right there that black line and the cornea. It's a little distorted because of fixation. Uh, and on this side, if you follow along, this should have been the limbus. The limbus should have been somewhere around here. It's kind of hard to see. What we do see, if you follow the inner aspect of the cornea, there is a space there, there's a gap. You can see kind of a rounded um, edge of the cornea and uh, a defect where there's this black tissue kind of protruding through the defect. You can see that the, there's corneal tissue on the surface of that area. So it looks like an intrastromal sort of lesion. It looks like there's a, a, a deep limbo slash corneal defect, the cystic looking uh, lesion that's carpeted or covered by this black tissue, right? Every time we see black in the eye, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is UVO tissue. You can see the iris, relatively normal iris on this side, kind of a blue green eye kind of iris, but the posterior aspect, it's always pigmented, got the ciliary body. So this tissue has a sort of the same aspect as the uvula. So here we go. The first one we received, let's see. Right. Let's see if I can get up. Even though the subgross image is not the best, I'm gonna give it a try because this would be very useful in this case. All right. Okay. So bear with me. So we are in that same location. There's some distortion of the of the tissue and uh, during processing. So it was. We were not able to get a full section right through that defect like we've seen, but we're close. I, I, I went deeper and you can see it gets thinner. We, we almost get there. But anyway, here's the cornea, this defect here. It's of course artifact. You guys see that it look normal. We have normal iris leaflet on one side, normal iris leaflet on the other side. There is a lens that is obviously normal. And here's the back of the eye, which you know, the posterior segment looks pretty normal. So we're gonna focus here on the front. So it is kind of the same thing we were describing. Here's the limbus and you can see there's a, a little bit of sclera right there. There, uh, iris, uh, sorry, corneal stroma coming this way, some limbo scleral coming this way and there's that intrastromal, intralimbo uh, lesion. And it is carpeted by this dark, tissue and if you compare it really looks like iris epithelium this is up okay so we're gonna do the same exercise follow the cornea jump the gap keep coming around and there it is 
right? So limbus, you can see the limbal sclera, and it obviously transitions into the corneal stroma. And right there in the middle, it's an impressively normal looking almost iris, right? You can see all the details. You got the iris, pigmented epithelium. You can even see dilator muscle, stroma. But that uh, iris tissue here is blending with the corneal stroma. Even forming some papillary. It's just living there, happy, entrapped, and uh, oblivious. It's interesting to see that there's normal iris right next to it, which suggests that this iris tissue is coming from a different plane of section, right? Maybe deeper. We went deeper and we were not able to find a better section of it. Let me just show you. I think we, we kind of, uh, while cutting through the block, histo went past that gap that we saw grossly. So the, this is a thousand micrometers deeper. You can see that the deep stroma kind of gets thinner a little bit, but it's still got the same lesion right there. And then at 2000, deeper than the original, it just goes away. So we were right at the margin. And also <laughs> that highlights the importance of taking gross notes and knowing where you cut. Because if you didn't take any gross notes, got this slide like this, you would totally miss a mass like that. When, you know, you read the description, there's a mass. Like, oh, no mass was identified because this looks very normal. And you do have a very significant cataract. And you would describe the cataract and uh, just go on to the next slide happily. And the clinicians would be like, are you crazy? Have you missed the gigantic thing in the corner? So what we think happened here, uh, and uh, it was very reminiscent of this one case that Gillian presented a long, long, long time ago, back when I had a full head full of hair and, uh, you know, bright eyed and uh, hope, hope for the future. Um, I think we're just visiting, right? Yeah. Yeah, Gillian was just visiting Coplala. And I was a fellow, I think. Yeah, you were. She came up with this case of, I think it was a chihuahua. Yeah. They had a, an identical lesion like that. And she brought a picture. She presented that at an um, ACVP meeting. And that gross picture stayed glued to the wall of Coppola for like about 10 years or so. <laughs> Someone took it out. So it was good because immediately I thought about this case. So yeah. uh, like this case, that case also was a uh, younger dog in that case, a cat in this case, where there was likely a traumatic lesion here when this dog was younger that caused this rupture, a prolapse of the iris into the stroma uh, created that defect. That prolapse iris sort of blended with the cornea, right? These young cats and dogs, these young animals, are, they're kind of very resilient in, in terms of, uh, you know, managing those kind of lesions and the tissue is still remodeling, et cetera. So kind of blended with it, created a connection with the interior chamber. And now we have a uh, kind of a four chambered eye in this case with a large cyst in the iris stroma, in, in, the, in the corneal stroma and limbus in this case, lined by uh, the iris. Interestingly, and what kind of uh, confirms the idea of trauma is the lens capsule rupture. One of the things that one might um, suspect here is something congenital. Could this be something congenital? Uh, yes, but then if you go to the lens, first it's a one-year-old cat and there's significant cataract. So everything you see from here to here is liquefied lens fibers. You can see the margins where the relatively normal looking lens fibers intersect with the liquefied lens fibers. And grossly also, it was very, um, a very uh, opaque lens, right? There are areas of mineralization of the lens fibers and ev even the epithelium here. There's fibrous metaplasia of the lens epithelial cells. They're becoming a little bit more fusiform. And here and there, you find the odd, so it's kind of cool if you leave the condenser out, you can kind of pick up the kind of the jigsaw puzzle of the lens. It's like a nature's Lego. Uh, and here uh, you find uh, the odd 
foamy macrophage kind of free floating in the liquid vitreous or in, in that uh, liquefied lens. That's important because if you go around, it's not obvious that there's lens capsule rupture in this section. Uh, here's the posterior lens capsule. So there's migration of the lens epithelial backwards. You lose the lens capsule here on the posterior polar aspect of it, but it's, it could be just thin. But the fact that there are macrophages inside the lens capsule and phagocytizing lens uh, basically nails it down. You shouldn't have any inflammatory cells inside the intralenticular space. So there was a lens capsule rupture, which kind of goes along with the idea of a traumatic event uh, that caused a perforation in the cornea and a lens capsule rupture. So kind of an oddball, cool looking case. Got two of those now. Do you think it could be one trauma? I think it could be, yeah. Okay. That's a very good idea. I, I, I think a blunt trauma uh, with a right amount of energy and location can cause that posterior decimus membrane rupture and posterior lens capsule rupture. Yeah. Also, yeah. Cool. Oh, we're shooting that. So let me get up here. So here is our diagnosis. It's kind of descriptive because, you know, it's not a name for this, so chronic heel corneal. I said perforation, but Gilliam has a very good point. That could be blunt trauma with intralesional iris prolapse information of a stromocystic lesion, corneal limbo staphyloma. Right. Uh, so a staphyloma in um, is defined of any as any weakness of the external layer of the eye, which causes a bulge. So that can be defined as a staphyloma. But calling that just a staphyloma doesn't make justice to the weirdness of it. So that's why, you know, went a little bit more uh, descriptive in this case. All right. Next one, what do we have there? A A9. So this is Luna, the eight-year-old female spade boxer mix. Um, we got the right eye. It's another cool case. Um, they describe irritable mass and the ventral pupillary margin with secondary glaucoma versus primary glaucoma. Corneal edema, midriasis, dyscoria, bophthalmus, and blind. <laughs> so um, this is an interesting case. The If you look at the eye itself, here is the, the whole thing. We got a marculia demodus cornea. You can see one of the iris leaflets and the other iris leaflets. Right away, you can see the mass they describe, right? But interestingly, it looks like a pretty pigmented eye, right? You can see how the back of the eye is sort of pale, the iris stroma is sort of pale. So every time you see something like that, we wonder if this is a blue eye dog. And it was a blue eye dog. It was a blue eye? It, it's a boxer mix. Who knows? Mixed with husky or something, but. So they describe blues less yellow. So likely uh, we understood that one eye was blue, which was this one, and the other one was yellowish. So kind of a um, also sometimes heterochromic. When, when pipums form, they turn the iris yellow. Yep. In blue eyes. It's a great so point. That too. might, might mm -hmm. be what they mean, but who knows? Exactly. But they, uh, oh yeah, this is the one. So I uh, emailed them about this one uh, with the eye color because they, they said blue yellow, and they said that they were referring to this one. I remember, but the other one was was darker. So it was a, um, a two different color eyes or a heterochromia, and this is the blue eye one. So you can see the mass they describe is kind of obvious right there. There's a two tone appearance to it. It's wider more anteriorly, a little bit more beige. But the eye, so uh, for blue eye dogs, what we look for is kind of this pale fundic appearance, the pale looking iris stroma, but observe how the uh, pigmented epithelium doesn't change, right? You, you only have a non-pigmented pigmented epithelium in albino animals, right? So in albino rabbits, uh, you won't see pigment at all. It's not the case here. Uh, even in blue eye dogs, they have pigmented epithelium. So 
here's what we have. Switch back. And I'm gonna give it a try. All right, here it is. Here's the cornea. Again, Mark Heliodemidus cornea. The less affected iris, or look less affected, and the one that was obviously affected by neoplasia, you can see. Uh, so we have the ciliary body right there, and there's the iris. The only thing, the only reason it's easy to recognize is because you follow the iris pigmented epithelium. And this mass sort of blends with the cornea. And since everything is edema, this grossly, it was really hard to identify anything. The lens, the back of the eye, there's cupping of the optic nerve and secondary glaucoma. That's not why we are here for. You know you're out of shape and uh, and probably with a respiratory virus when you get uh, you can't even talk and you get you know, winded just by sitting and talking. Long word of days, but I felt like I was fit. Okay, cornea. Cornea edema is something that is hard for us to diagnose. We talk about that a lot, but this is one example of a case where I think it's easy or it's, uh, it's less problematic to diagnose corneal edema. First, there's peripheral corneal stromal vascularization. So we know there's something going on. When we move forward centrally, there's a, an obvious expansion of the stroma. There's some distortion of it, which is natural. It could be artifact, but uh, it looks well-oriented in some areas. And there's this wider aspect of the stroma, more superficially. Right, so that's kind of the type of situation where making the diagnosis of corneal edema uh, becomes a little bit easier. The other thing that we look for, sometimes when we have stromal edema, we end up with corneal epithelial edema. So you can see some you know, hydropic degeneration of the keratinocytes right there, which is uh, an added feature that can help. Okay, so corneal edema check. Not surprisingly, there's this huge mass pressing on the cornea and probably affecting the corneal endothelium. And here, just to separate things, we do the 50 shades of pink game. So corneal epithelium, corneal stroma. Here's decimus membrane, a little bit of anterior chamber and the mass, right? And you can see the iris pigmented epithelium there. So the mass is extensively necrotic. Everything in the middle here is acellular. So we're going to focus on what's left of the mass. And that is probably why we have that uh, two-tone sort of appearance grossly of the mass. Interestingly, I thought the brownish area was going to be the necrotic area, but it turns out to be the other way around. When we go higher magnification, we realize that Yep, this is neoplastic. These are all cells of a kind. They are fusiform to elongated cells that are arranged sort of in streams, sometimes forming bundles. Um, there are some lymphocytes and plasma cells scattered throughout. You can see this higher density cell areas. Don't let that fool you. Um, for the pathologists out there, if I got higher magnification like here, didn't tell you where I was. And I'll say, what do you think this looks like? So answer that on your head. And I would say something like, you know, soft tissue sarcoma or a peripheral nerve sheet tumor, something along those lines. It does have that neuropil looking background that you can see sort of here, for example. So this is what we diagnose. Uh, in general, if someone calls this a soft tissue sarcoma, it's iris stroma, eh, you know, soft tissue sarcoma are kind of subcutaneous classification, but just a, a sarcoma or a, you know, or, or, or a peripheral nerve sheet tumor or something like that, we totally fine. This is an entity that we recognize in the eye 
and it happens in blue-eyed dogs. It's a schwannoma of the blue-eyed dogs. Um, and this has the classic appearance of it, like a schwannoma or a peripheral nerve sheet tumor like lesion. Here's a normal nerve just existing. And you can see how the tumor infiltrated, uh, expanded, and sort of effaced the whole uveal tissue, uh, anterior uveal tissue, going to the ciliary body even. Uh, it wasn't clear that the mass was in the ciliary body, but when you go higher magnification, you realize these are only plastic cells. And that's the, the tricky part of this tumor, right? This one is forming a mass, but they don't always form a mass. They can be kind of sneaky and sort of more like distort the iris and the irritocornal angle structures then form a mass. If we go to the less affected looking iris, I think you see some of that. It didn't look like much, but when you get higher magnification, you can see that there is a layer of neoplastic cells. So here's more, um, this is normal looking iris stroma of a blue-eyed animal. I can see the collagen, not a lot of pigment, but there is a layer on top here, which one might be tempted to think is just a fibrovascular membrane until you realize it's nor fibrous nor vascular, is a layer of similar neoplastic cells carpeting the iris surface. So um, for clinicians and pathologists out there, got a blue eye dog, for clinicians, if you, if you got a blue eye dog with what looks like a uveitis, it's not responding. There's some distortion of the iris uh, of the tissue and uh, uh, develops glaucoma and keeps getting worse without treatment. It might want to be suspicious of uh, showing them all the blue-eyed dogs. For pathologists, uh, if you get a dog that's enucleated like that, it's a blue-eyed dog. You know, huskies are the classic ones, but any, any blue-eyed dog. And it has this sort of, it doesn't look right. You know, there's this sort of uh, uh, higher cellularity, but it's not inflammatory, but it's kind of confused because of the iris stroma is a little bit non-pigmented. Um, you might want to throw a GFAP there. They, they will stain uh, on occasion, not all the time, but most of the time with GFAP. And it can be sort of localized. Uh, another cool thing that happens, and we tend not to use that as a diagnostic feature because it's so weak but it happens so often that it's kind of hard to ignore. Very often, these tumors, they do this carpeting uh, a phenomenon and they pull the iris pigmented epithelium around like that. So it's kind of an ectropia nuvia. And this is very obvious clinically and uh, histologically. So, you know, add that nugget there to your uh, checklist of potential um, uh, features of the schwannoma deploy dogs. And again, if you look at this guy, right, you might be tempted to even call this going to this genesis. I don't remember if I did or not. Maybe I put it equivocal because it's kind of an areas like tissue, but it's more, is it, is it an areas like tissue or a tumor like tissue, you know, attaching the arborized end of the membrane? Kind of don't know. But uh, so you can have a case where you have both iris leaflets looking like this. And the dog is enucleated because of glaucoma. And it's not, it doesn't look like a fully developed, uh, you know, a, a version of this tumor, but it's enough to cause glaucoma and to cause the, the dog to get an eye enucleated. And in the back, just to confirm the glaucoma, here's some cupping of the optic nerve, the lamina cribosa, which are the collagen beans that should be in level with the sclera are way down here. So definitely posteriorly displaced and there's loss of ganglion cells. Um, we don't have that, uh, well, maybe a, here a little bit more of a complete inner retinal atrophy, but it's not full thickness retinal atrophy like we discussed can happen in dogs, but glaucoma nonetheless. We have it. Yeah, but that's a good point. Um, I think we haven't. The question was, have we done SOX10 before? Yeah, not for these cases, but that is a, a good shout out. And, and it might be worth doing um, to see if it's more reliable than GFAP. Should, oh, as far as I know, there's always a positive for SOX10, right? Right, yeah, exactly. 
it's one of those that we, we don't have available here, so we we didn't. But yeah, absolutely, it, it, and uh, it's a good idea to give it a try. Yeah, um, I was going to say that sometimes the ectropia in UVA can be so dramatic that um, they'll report a color change to the iris from blue to brown, um, as opposed to blue to yellow <laughs> in this case. But um, yeah, so sometimes that ectropia and that pulling around of the iris epithelium can be really dramatic. So. All right, Maria says that lab stage bio has a good sock stand and everything else. So shout out to them. So schwannoma, spindle cell tumor, the blue-eyed dogs, uh, and glaucoma. I added gonadesgenesis here. So the reason I added that is that there's a distortion, but it's important for the other eye, right? It's important because we know that if one eye gets diagnosed with gonadesgenesis, or, you know, potentially primary glaucoma. The other one is at a higher risk of also developing glaucoma. So that was more for to trigger them to go uh, do a gonioscopy on that other eye and maybe start preventative treatment. All right, I'm gonna pass it on to Gilliam. She is gonna finish off. Alrighty, so the first one is, how do we hide this thing? It's annoying me. You have to open the chat and close it in. The chat is like the uh, R would help. Okay, so 958. This is a 13-year-old uh, English setter. Uh, we got very little history, but they said uh, basically had glaucoma. So um, we got a globe with um, a bunch more lesions that we could see. Um, so when we received it, we thought it was buthalmic. Uh, the cornea was opaque. And actually you can see an ulcerated area here with um, lifting up of the surrounding edges. So that's suggestive of an indolent ulcer. Um, the iris we thought was thick and mottled tan to brown. Um, the lens we thought was pretty cloudy. So we thought there was a cataract. However, the position of the lens is okay. The vitreous was kind of brownish and liquefied. Uh, the retina was detached. Uh, you can see it down here. I don't think this is actually the retina. This is condensed vitreous. Um, and yeah, so there was some, also some tan gel in the anterior chamber. Um, so let me do the switcheroo here. So up here at low mag, you can see here's that iris, um, sorry, corneal ulcer. And you can see that epithelium has lifted off at the edge. So that's good for an indolent ulcer. We'll get that higher mag if I remember. Um, there's a bunch more things going on in this eye. Um, the iris and ciliary body are very deeply purple. So they are hypercellular and they're also expanded. And also in some areas that we lose that purple um, and then it gets to be a little bit more pink. Um, so those areas of pink are actually areas of necrosis of what's going on in the iris uh, and the anterior uvea. There's the lens. Yep, there's the retina. It is detached. Um, and then this was that condensed vitreous that we saw in the gross photo. So we'll start here. So the definition of an indolent ulcer is where you have um, poor epithelial attachment and you get tear of the epithelium. And so in this case, uh, we have a pretty nice uh, distinction between unattached or detached epithelium and attached epithelium over here. Where the epithelium is attached, there's still an identifiable basal layer. And then when it becomes detached, um, we sort of lose that nice organization of the uh, corneal epithelium. And so we call that loss of polarity. Uh, sometimes you'll get little eddy formation, which I don't really see in this um, field. Um, but also the surface layers of the corneal epithelium are keratinized, so there's keratinization as well. Um, so there's some longstanding corneal disease here. The corneal stroma itself is infiltrated by scattered neutrophils, and there's actually hemorrhage in it. 
And that's because of probably how well vascularized it is. So there's some leakage of blood from those blood vessels. Here's that host of blood vessels populating that corneal stroma. So let's move into the uveal tract now. Um, so, um, all right. Uh, so here's some of that, those areas of hypercellularity and increased basophilia due to a dense cellular infiltrate. Um, and it's very patchworky, but you can see the areas that are more pink are composed of neoplastic cells, uh, sorry, necrotic cells. So this is a population of neoplastic cells. So let's go higher mag. So these cells are not forming any structures. They're just existing in sheets. Um, and so they are, they're not forming any kind of stroma. Um, so they're supported by the pre-existing um, uveal stroma, and they have relatively um, distinct cell borders. So as Dr. D says, these would pass the tweezer test. And that means, do you think, can you picture going in with a tiny pair of tweezers and plucking out a single cell without disturbing its neighbors? And that is a good indication that we're looking at a round cell tumor. Um, so this is a round cell tumor. Let me see if I can find an area with better morphology, because it's a little bit weird there. Um... Better. I think a lot of the cells we were just looking at were probably a little bit ischemic and on their way out. Uh, but anyway, here's a slightly um, an area where the cells have better morphology. Uh, so the cells are round. Um, they have very little cytoplasm. Um, it's sort of eosinophilic, and they have relatively large nuclei with very prominent, very large magenta nuclei. Sometimes they have more than one nucleolus. Um, uh, so this is consistent with a round cell neoplasm, and I proposed that it was lymphoma. Um, the nuclei are fairly large compared to a red blood cell, which we don't actually have in this field, um, but that indicates this is probably a large cell lymphoma, uh, with large B-cell lymphoma probably being the most likely. Um, there is, as we discussed at lower mag, very prominent survival around blood vessels, um, which is probably due to ischemia, uh, the necrosis that is. Um, so there's that sort of patchworky survival around blood vessels. Um, let's see here. It's uh, the neoplastic cells do infiltrate the iridociliary epithelium, which is fairly characteristic of lymphoma. And sometimes they will also infiltrate the retina, which I don't think was present in this case. Oops. So there is some cortical lens fiber degeneration. So there is a cataract here, um, probably associated with pressure from the mass um, and or a nutritional problem of the le lens. Here's that condensed vitreous. There's a bunch of junk in it, which some of, some of which is probably um, necrotic neoplastic cells. The squiggles are fibrin, I believe. The spider. Wow, actually, that looks really interesting. I don't know what that stuff is. I hope it's not a fungus. No, it's like a. Hmm, let's let's move on. <laughs> all right, the retina is detached. From DNA. <laughs> yeah, from all those uh, cells that have lysed, mm -hmm. all those uh, neopla necrot necrotic neoplastic cells. All right, um, <clears throat> the retina is detached. There are some ganglion cells left. Um, so perhaps the retina detached prior to glaucoma development, since that uh, retinal detachment is often protective of uh, retinal ganglion cells. All right, so here were our diagnoses. Um, so uveal round cell neoplasm, uh, DVX large cell lymphoma, um, and there were a bunch of other things going on as well. Hopefully not fungus, but now I'm going to go revisit that. Um, so uh, uveal lymphoma can either be part of systemic lymphoma or it can be uh, isolated to the eye, in which case it's, in which case it's called solitary ocular lymphoma. Um, and uh, that requires staging of the patient to determine what uh, the actual, uh, which variety it happens to be. So 
There we go. I have a few minutes. We'll go on to the next one. Bit of a th bit of a theme here. Um, okay. This one is Daisy, a five-year-old spade female Great Dane, I believe. Oh, oh wow. Button mashing. Yes, no, not a Great Dane, sorry. This is a four-year-old neutered male German Shepherd mix. Um, we got some history with this one. Um, they say corneal edema, corneal vascularization. There were a lot of corneal changes, but they couldn't really see a lot beyond that. Um, they say glaucoma and bufalmus. Um, and there we go. So we got the globe. We bisected it. We thought it was bufalmic. Um, and the cornea, I took a picture from the front because the cornea had this interesting pattern to it. Um, and then there was this denser infiltrate and I couldn't tell whether this was actually in the corneal stroma or in the anterior chamber in the, or in the iris. Um, the pupil is in the center here and it, the cornea is quite opaque over the pupil. Um, turns out this, these corneal changes were not that exciting histologically. But uh, when we hemisected the globe, um, you can see there's this white material that's in the anterior chamber and over here it's in the anterior chamber and it's also carpeting or filling the posterior chamber and carpeting the ciliary body surface. Uh, there's a little bit of hemorrhage scattered around in the vitreal space. The center of the optic nerve is cupped right here and the lens is pretty opaque, so there's probably a cataract. Um, so. So a bit of a theme that we have going on here. So this, there's this very densely cellular uh, material in the anterior chamber. Uh, you can actually make out the iris pretty well. So it's not actually infiltrating the iris. And that's similar and true on the other side where we can make out the structures of the iris pretty well. This On this side, it does infiltrate into the ciliary body a little bit, but most, mostly what we have are cells carpeting the iris surfaces um, and the, ciliary body surface on this side. Um, so that right there makes us think about something metastatic. Um, inflammatory processes don't typically, never mind. Inflammatory cells can also carpet, <laughs> um, but um, they often will also infiltrate. So once again, we have a pretty dense population. From this magnification, it looks fairly homogenous, um, which is suggestive of a neoplastic population. Uh, the cells are not forming any structures, and they don't really seem to be making very much stroma. They are round cells and the ciliary borders, uh, sorry, the cellular borders are not very distinct in this case, unlike the last one. Um, and the cells have kind of a decent amount of kind of this weird vacuolated cytoplasm. <laughs> um, just in this field alone, you can see there are a number of mitotic figures. Um, so we've got pretty decent mitotic rate. Um, the cells have kind of coarsely clumped chromatin and single pretty prominent nucleoli. Um, I conjectured that this was also a neoplastic round cell population. Um, I also considered something else. What did I consider? Uh, histiocytic sarcoma. Um, but remember that this patient is only four years old. Um, and I think histiocytic sarcomas typically are a little bit older population uh, when they develop. Um, so I really thought that this was probably going to be a lymphoma. And the fact that it was carpeting surfaces in this eye um, really made me think that this is definitely gonna be part of a metastatic, like a systemic problem in general, as opposed to something that developed in the eye. Um, we haven't received any feedback uh, from this case, so I'm not really sure. And it also is doing this interesting carpeting of uh, the zonular ligaments and the vitreous that's kind of condensed here, which is a little bit unusual. Yeah, I wish we had looked into it um, when we were 
during the lymphoma paper as to the distribution and correlation with mm. primary versus secondary or systemic lymphoma. So that can be something very useful to know. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to our PowerPoint for a moment. Um, so poorly differentiated intraocular metastatic round cell neoplasm, uh, DDX lymphoma, and histiocytic sarcoma. Uh, well, la the last case and this case, they have not uh, elected for immunohistochemistry at this point. Um, this one was a little bit weird because there was quite a bit of cytoplasm to those cells, but I still think lymphoma is most likely. Uh, especially in a young dog, which lymphoma can affect any age animal. And amongst the various options of metastatic neoplasia, I figured lymphoma was most likely in a young patient. Mm -hmm. So there we go. That's all we have. And it's nine o'clock. So we should end. Thanks, everyone.